Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I don't know if you know what's about to go down. All right. Let me paint you a picture real quick. James and I were tasked with talking about, I'm going to hit four, you're hitting three, huh, James? Seven false belief systems, worldviews, lies, deceptions in 60 minutes. That's intense. That's a lot of information that we're going to share with you. It was very heavy on us. I know we were talking this week and it was like, how is this possible? How is this going to happen? And, and I didn't even intend to come up here and talk. But the main re I didn't intend to come up here and explain because I need every second, if you, if you can imagine. But as they're pulling up the slide, the reason why I really wanted to explain this, I don't usually build slides. I don't usually do this um, because I can articulate and navigate through the waters that we're going to hit. But... Because of the heaviness and the stuff we're going to get through today, I thought it was really necessary to give you bullet points for those that are note takers and write down and, t and be able to research this stuff later because I am barely scratching the surface right now. I mean, I, I really, I could talk about one of these items for the next 15 hours because of the lies and deceptions that are weaved throughout them. So... Don't get distracted by the slide. My purpose and intention to make sure and give that is a resource for you. But, but like me, when I see a slide, I'm like constantly looking at that and I don't even hear what the person is saying. So I pray the Lord kind of does that as a navigation for you that you are able to write down, take some notes, and then try and follow along with me. Amen. Because it's going to be a lot of information. And uh, so let's go ahead and pray first. Let's give this to the Lord and really um, ask for him to take control of this. Amen. All right, Father, thank you so much, God. Thank you so much for bringing all of these hearts here today. God, we surrender and give it to you because we can trust you, God. We come to you and search you, as the scriptures say, because we can reason with you, God. You're a reasonable God that gives us answers and explains things to us and doesn't come at us like this uh, authoritative dictator. God, you are loving and patient and compassionate. And you are so patient to walk us through things that sometimes we have blinders on for years and we don't understand how to ever see them as wrong, to see them as lies. And it's just something that we need you to work us through, God. Some of the things we're going to talk about today, God, are things that are intricately involved in our culture. And sometimes they don't feel wrong. But God, we pray that your word would testify the truth today and that you would be exalted. You would be magnified as king and that it's your word that we trust in. And so we give this to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So like I said, we do have the slide up there. There's a lot of information I'm going to cram into the next hour. But I want to start off. Is the microphone all right with this? I'm yeah. very Italian. Speak a lot with my hands. Uh, the first thing I want to start off by saying is we are not here today to compete among other religions. That is not our sole purpose, all right? Our goal is to not just bash other beliefs and then crown ourselves as victor. I'm not trying to come up here arrogantly saying that I figured it out, folks. I got it right. I know that I trust in the truth and I know that it's true because of the evidence at hand. But I'm not here to just crown myself as victor, nor should any of our hearts be in that place. Although that's often an accusation, and to be quite frank, the persona often pursued, per, uh, perceived from insta evangelists on social media, uh, that is the perception that comes from Christians often days through these resources. We go on, we say this is a lie, we bash them, we hit them with the Bible, Bible thumper context, right? And we walk away and say, ha, I showed them. And I pray that that's not what we're here today for. That's not what we're about. So... For those that have past experiences in these beliefs, and there may be some, all right, or are currently wrestling with the ideologies that we're going to hit on today, 
I want you to know that we love you. I want you to know that we're concerned for you. I want you to know that we are available and God is available to patiently walk you through these things because they are muddy waters. The world is filthy. And so it's expected that the sanctification process is happening throughout our life. Sometimes there are things that are immediately happening right when we first come to the Lord and you're like, God, I give that to you. And then there's other things that you just kind of hold on to because they're kind of just weaved in the heart. And you're like, I don't think that's wrong. Like it feels okay, right? And so we're going to hit on things like that today that may hit straight for the heart because it's just so involved into our culture. All right? I don't think... That's why we're here today, and I, I think that was Sonny's intention to bring us together and search the scriptures, right? That was his desire, to search these things, because there's so many lies out there that are deceiving and leading people to destruction. It's their souls we're talking about. So let's keep that in consideration when we're sharing about these things, right? And although that sounds unloving, that they're heading to destruction, maybe some people are actually thinking, oh boy... He's about to touch on some things that I don't know if I'm prepared for. And he doesn't sound very loving. He's a big guy. He's up there. He's aggressive. His blood's pumping. I don't feel like this is love. All right? But that's the issue is the world has defined love and our feelings immediately dictate on what, it, what truly is love. And I'm here to declare today that that's what the agenda is. The things I'm going to talk on, the topics and, and these belief systems, that's where it's coming from. It's a spiritual issue. And they're trying to, to redefine terms like love to be associated with feelings instead of truth. Okay? So we love you. We want you to know that there is a living hope. Amen? A living hope which has been tried and tested through thousands of generations. And you can believe it. Here today, you can believe it because the hope is patient, that hope is compassionate and available to all willing to come today. Amen. Now, for the Christians in here, let me give you a gentle exhortation, okay? Because this is something that I'm going to preach to myself right now. This is something that when I grab this information, I'm locked and loaded, I get on social media, and I'm going to go full force. I don't want you to walk out those doors with that head today, okay? Or that heart. Let me give you a quick reminder and an exhortation from the scriptures. It says in 2 Timothy 2.24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. All right? Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So remember, when we are sharing, we are shedding light on lies and deception. All right? But we are also handling the very soul of an individual. So as 1 Peter 3.15 says, this is, this is a, 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 a popular verse, that when we're approaching apologetics, everyone is familiar with 1 Peter 3.15. Okay? And if you're not familiar with it, I got it up there. But there's something we often miss in the context of that verse. We, we, we get all charged up with being able to give a defense, being reasonable and ready to share the truth, right? This is our verse, 1 Peter 3, 15, it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. That's the context. Honor Christ as holy in your hearts. Okay, sanctify him in your hearts. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks, for a reason of the hope that is in you. That's why we're here today. We want to share the hope that is in us. Someone's going to ask you after this, Hey, what do you think about this? Or why are you so happy? Or how do you have wisdom in this area? How come you haven't associated yourself with these beliefs? Why do you stand out? Be prepared. That's why we're here today. Amen? Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, it will happen. Not if you get slandered. When you get slandered, those who re revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We were doing a, a video last night uh, with my friend Flynn and, and Ryan. And, and that is the natural deflection. 
to someone not appreciating the truth. You tell them the truth, oh, you're hateful. Anyone been called hateful in here? Especially on social media? Bigoted, homophobic, all of the above. You've been slandered these words because it's, A, it's a deflection. It's a straw man to try and attack you so that you don't have to answer. Now you have to build a case to defend yourself. And it's a distraction from actually talking about the, the issue at hand. Right? But they, they shouldn't be able to, to, to slander our name because of our character, the way that we are gentle and actually walk in love. We say, hey, Christians are loving, but we're over here doing this. Right? Be patient. Enduring evil. That's what it said in 2 Timothy. That's our goal today, to share the hope with a reasonable de de defense, with gentleness and respect. Now, other translations say meekness. And you understand that. That kind of hits it home. Meekness. What kind of a, uh, ideology today teaches you to be meek? Everyone teaches you to be proud. I like what Flynn said yesterday. Pride, pride month is nothing new. It's just celebrated for 30 days. But for the last thousands of years, they've been celebrating pride month. Our world is corrupted with pride and celebrates pride every day. This is nothing new. They just put it on a poster. Right? Well, that brings us to the topics at hand. So go ahead and go to the next slide. We're going to observe the core doctrines that resonate around Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age spirituality, and to finish the ecumenical slash emergent church. You're like, how on earth are you going to do that? Let's go. So because of our limited time, I'm going to head straight for the bullseye on this one, all right? These things have a lot of commonality. I could talk just about Hinduism for the next couple hours, okay? I could talk about just Buddhism. But there's a commonality between them that you're going to see really sticks out, okay? So though their beliefs may vary on certain specific things, the majority will agree on the bullet points that I'm going to get to. So first, a quick overview. Hinduism. We have Hinduism here, right? The word Hindu itself means the people and culture of the Indus River region, or aka the Indian people, the people of India. All right? It is the world's third largest religion, second in size only to Christianity and Islam. Any of you guys know that? That Hinduism is the third largest religion? How educated are you on Hinduism? Anyone super educated? I mean, I'm not even that educated. I'm about to give you a, a breakdown. There is a ton of their beliefs in our world. And I think it's really necessary to be able to spot the lie. That's what I teach my kids. Wear that truth radar, like Mr. Hughesby says, put it up and spot the lie. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. It's stated to be the oldest organized religion existing, which dates back to roughly 2000 BC. Now take in quote I there, I say organized because Judaism is the oldest religion that we're familiar with. But it's because it starts in the beginning. In Genesis 1 it says, who created the heavens and the earth? And it proves the promises all the way through of an upcoming Messiah and then we see the finished account of who that Messiah was and what he did for us. So it is the oldest religion, but Hinduism is the oldest organized religion. And most people agree with that. The Hindus, many have sacred writings. They have lots of poetic writings, okay? Lots of things that stick out. And just to name a few, the most popular are the Vedas. All right, I'm going to totally destroy this word, and my Indian friends are going to laugh at me. But it's the Mahabharata. All right? And then the last is the Bhagavad Gita. Okay? Majority of them are poetic. There's not a lot of historical references in there. They don't even have a human founder. Like, there isn't a time and a place of when someone said, this is what we believe. It's a generality and it's really integrated in the social and economics of India. 
If you go there, you see the caste system still displayed today, and you're like, well, that's a social system. That's politics. No, that is their religious system. It's very integrated into everything that they do. And it's oppression at the end of the day, and I want to talk a lot about that. I just don't have time, all right? But unlike Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, Hinduism does not have a human founder. Now, majority of the beliefs are poetic, they're subjective, open to interpretation, and in the end, they come down to basically everything being an illusion. And that illusion is called Maya, all right? Everything is abstract. And so if you can call it abstract, then when you walk into the scene and say, I feel this is what it's talking about, okay, yeah, that's working for you. I think it's working for me this way. And there's no disagreement. There's no authority. There's no truth. It is a pantheistic religion, which means everything is God. Okay? Before I go on, I, I planned on... Are you touching on Mormonism today? You are? Cool. I won't even go into that. Mormonism fits in. It has, has more gods than Hinduism. And I was going to say, hey, let me just throw in Hin uh, Mormonism. Because you, when you look at Hinduism, they have over 330 million gods. Okay? And counting. But Mormonism has more. They're the religion with the most. And they're like, no, we're monotheistic. No. You get to become a god, don't you? You get to get your own planet. So in reality, Mormonism is the religion of the most gods. Because it truly does believe that everyone, every believer will be a god. And they've far surpassed. I mean, Satan is has increased that religion so far, it's probably passing 330 million for sure, uh, destructive souls. Next we have Buddhism. Go ahead and go to the next one. Here, this is traced back to a man, all right, named Siddhartha Gautama. And the evidence traced back to him living around 480 BC. All right, Siddhartha was a Hindu. Remember that, because Buddhism came from Hinduism. Which is why I'm leading to this point, and I'm where I'm heading to, all right? Siddhartha was a Hindu, and he was born and raised as a young, rich kid, which was locked in his house because his father, who was a king, was worried that his son would leave and be harmed because he saw the destructive nature of the world. So this king, trying to protect his son, built this giant wall around Siddhartha and treated him as he was. Royalty brought in servants, brought in women, brought in food, and and treasured him inside the walls. Well, we all know that's vanity, and he wanted something more. So he begged and pleaded with his father, and he asked if he could go out of the palace. So Siddhartha had this desire, and I say that in quotes. All right, go ahead and note that because I'm going to point it out later. Siddhartha had a desire, and he told his dad he wanted to leave. All right. His dad collected people, he cleaned up the streets, and he painted this idea of what the world was really like. And he said, I'm going to place this person right here so that when he walks by, he has an observation of what the world is like. And he completely distorted the image of what that world actually functioned as. So he went ahead and let Siddhartha out. Siddhartha roamed around and observed these certain scenes that were staged and upon observing them he came up with four troubling sights these were four things that he saw and then he created after coming back home these things called four noble truths okay and those four truths consist of this life consists of suffering well yeah yes it does we know why because sin entered and destroyed everything Siddhartha recognized that, and he said, yes, it consists of suffering. But then he says, we suffer because we have desire of things that are impermanent. I could semi-agree with him, right? I can turn my desire into wanting a truck so bad. I want a newer truck. I want it so bad, I desire it, right? And that's impermanent. That's something that doesn't last forever. And so it distorts my heart. It, it, it creates a distraction from the important things in life, all right? So I can, I can kind of understand that. This is where it gets crazy, all right? 
The third one, it says the way to liberate oneself from suffering is by eliminating all desire. Okay? Now, this is where the quotations come in. My pastor, uh, Jim Roden, quoted this the other day, and I couldn't, I couldn't help but say it. He asked this, this uh, mic drop, and he says, Was Siddhartha's desire to liberate himself from desire good or bad? He had a desire to be set free from desire because he said desire was bad. It's kind of mind-numbing, isn't it? But that's what put him in that perspective. Is he said that all desires are bad, and I won't agree with him there. All desires are bad, and so I desire to get rid of desire. Kind of opposite there, huh? And then the last noble truth is this. Desires can be eliminated, and nirvana, enlightenment, reached by following something called the Eightfold Path. Now, they get really far into things, um, but I'm going to keep going, all right? And you'll understand why, because it all stems down to this. The next one on our list is New Age Spirituality, all right? This is the heavy one. This is the one that everyone will be familiar with stuff, even if you have no idea what it is, because it's everywhere. The reason I rest here is because this belief system really is the rancid buffet table of our time. Okay? Imagine going into Golden Corral. Some of you may hate this example because maybe you don't like Golden Corral. I enjoy my Golden Corral sometimes, all right? So let me have this example. You're super excited. You go into the building. You're like, man, I'm hungry. I'm going to get my plates worth. I'm going to eat a bunch. And I have this desire to go in there and feed my belly. And it's an expensive price today, these days. It's really raised up, right? So you're going to get your money's worth. You get in line. There's always a line at Golden Corral, right? It's always packed. And you're like, man, I just want to get through this line. So you pay the bill. Then you got to go wait in another line. And you're standing there. Your stomach's grumbling. And you're like, I can't wait to get to this place and get fill my plate. The anticipation is killing you, right? But then when you arrive, you reach the counter, you see bowl after bowl, dish after dish of rotten, infested meats and vegetables all the way down. That's what we're talking about today. I'm trying to give you a visual, all right? I don't mean it to be super demeaning for those that, that have followed or do follow these beliefs. Although that's the truth. That's what it is. It's a rancid buffet table. And the New Age spirituality is literally a conglomeration of Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Gnosticism, and then weaved all throughout it has the occult integrated into it. So basically it's everything. And that's what we live in today as a society that says everything's accepted. So I want to hit home on this one. I think this is the important one to really nail. And if this sounds appetizing, a rancid buffet table, I am so glad you are here today. Because I got to tell you about a giant, awesome, meaty steak that is cooked perfect and delicious and served with a giant baked potato. And it's going to be the best meal you've ever tasted compared to that distorted, rancid, rotten meat. Amen? That's what we're here for today is to point that out. But first I've got to show you the corrupt food in order to appreciate that best meal at the end, right? So the reason I didn't dive into Hinduism and Buddhism is because New Age belief system really is what the world is offering today. It's pickings from lots of different ideologies, okay? And then it's served on this golden self-help guru platter to make you feel great. Majority of celebrities endorse or support some way or form of New Age spirituality. Oprah Winfrey, Eckhart Tolle, very popular of their time, are significant spokesmen for these belief systems. And you'd say, well, Oprah is kind of non-confrontational. She just uh, appreciates everyone. Yes, that's my point. That's where we're headed. Overall, if you don't know key specifics of this world worldview, you will be familiar with terms and they will stick out to you. So there are eight fundamental beliefs that New Age believers follow, all right? The first one is this, 
all is one. That, that terminology is known as monism, all right? The idea is literally there is no difference between humans, animals, and even rocks. We're all one, okay? All things are the same substance, which ultimately is an illusion that takes in the Hinduistic belief, but everything that exists are basic manifestations of one undivided reality. That's the reason why the earth is so sacred. No body, nobody can be wrong because all are the same and why you talk to your golf ball every time before you swing, that's the thing that's gonna make you do better. It's becoming one with the golf ball. And that sounds crazy, but when was the last time your coach said, be one with the ball? Be one with the ball. It's taught everywhere. Because that's the core foundation. All are one. All right? We, of course, know that we are not all one. All right? We've been created and held together by God himself. Look at the very beginning of the scriptures in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Colossians 1.17, it says, He is before all things. But I thought all things were one. No, God created all things. And in Him, all things hold together. There's a distinction there. It's different. And people get distracted by that. And I don't understand how. This is what the world wants you to believe. Because if you state that we are all the same, then there are no intrinsic values between you and a fence post. Right? So there's no value. And so abortion becomes acceptable because, hey, you're no different than that animal down the street that's having babies. So let's try and save some dogs that are running wild and get rid of some people. Right? It really comes down to an atheistic evolutionary belief. But it's all tied together. It's all tied together. The next one is, the next belief is all is God. You're like, wow, that seems really different, right? But it's so in, in, in interweaved into our belief systems. They believe that everything exists is God, all right, which is known as pantheism. I said this earlier, but pantheism breaks down to all is God and God is all, right? God is more of an it than a he, and they reject the idea of a personal creator who exists outside of creation with ultimate authority. Because if you can reject that, everything is fair game. I remember talking to a friend before they came to the Lord. We were sitting down, and I remember my first question was, how do you see God? Who is God to you? And I remember him really thinking heavily about that. I remember that being a mental notation for where he was going to go in his life because the the way that you view the creator really affects the way that you see the rest of your life the way that you see every individual you encounter where ultimate authority comes from and if you do believe that god is in all things then you're basically saying you're subject to things that deteriorate and i remember that being like this light bulb in his head and it was amazing but it's just those simple questions that you can ask people when it comes down to these ideas. You are the determining factor in all equations and you just need to realize it. I'm going to get more into that later. But we are merely a force, you guys recognize that term? Or an energy that contains the power of the universe within it. My friend Flynn here, we did a YouTube video on Star Wars. All right, and everyone, I, I have a lot of friends at work that <coughs> love Star Wars. And I got a lot of Christian friends that love Star Wars, okay? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to punch you in the face. Uh, the, the idea of Star Wars, go, go and watch that video. I'm not trying to plug myself. It was just full of awesome content that Flynn knew a ton about, all right? But the main thing sold in Star Wars, this awesome million dollar, billion dollar saga, What's the selling point? The force. It's the force. It's not becoming a Jedi. I mean, that's uh, it's an awesome approach from them. Like, yeah, I get to be this awesome ninja dude or whatever. But no, it's the force. Figuring out the force, the energy. 
These teachings are literally weaved in every majority video out there. Majority of every video. And then they just call it science fiction. But at the end of the day, even George Lucas himself was very honest in his interviews. So honest that he stated his intentions were clear to promote the force as an ideology, not science fiction. He truly believed it. And he was trying to teach it. That was his evangelical tool. That was his way to get it out. Not saying he's evangelical. Sorry if I used the wrong terminology there. But what does God tell us about this in, in the book of John? Chapter 1, right in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And He was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that made that was made. It seems pretty self-explanatory, folks. And the reason why I believe that is because the Word has been proven true time and time again. I'm not just believing a book that makes me feel better so that I can have these arguments. Jesus declared it, and he, he proved it. He made it clear. It's clear that we have a creator, and all things consist by him and through him, his hand. I remember one time we were evangelizing at the swap meet down the road. This was years back. Flynn's going to remember this conversation because it got our blood boiling a little bit. It was an intense situation. But he came across this conversation with this witch. She literally stated she practiced Wicca. Okay? She was very clear about it. Everything that she believed. And she started to mention all of these things that I'm saying right now. That all are God and in all. And, and God is all. And we're all in one. And then there was this pivotal moment in the conversation. Where Flynn came along. And he said this, alright? He calmly looked her in the eyes and he said, well, the second law of thermodynamics states that everything has an end and all things are breaking down. So that means your God is losing its power and it's deteriorating. And at first she was like, like dumbfounded. Like, wait, you just, you just said my God is losing its power? But then she had to think about it for a second because science... Real science, objective science, demonstrates that to be true. And science confirms everything that God says. And so she literally had to believe that because her power came from the earth, and the earth is breaking down, folks. If you haven't looked outside and seen, everything's broken. I mean, I went to Wilcox last week, and they told me about this crazy earthquake. And I'm like, in Wilcox? In a giant earthquake? Like, I thought that was usually around, like, lots of water and stuff. No, they had a crazy earthquake last year that affected things. The world is broken. And this person was putting her faith in a God that had no power, had no energy, had no source. It was completely false. She was furious. But being consistent, she had to believe that. She had to. Because we have a creator and all things have a beginning, we know that... We have an end, and the Creator stands outside of time, right? Time and matter. And He holds it with compassion and yet with a righteous judgment. So science confirms this and states exactly what God says is true. Now I'm going to fly through the next couple ones, uh, but just for the sake, on the last slide, there are a few links on there. I put uh, James's resource up there. There's a ton of of information out there, okay? But I really do, I need to keep moving, all right? So please write down those resources, go home and study, and take notes on these things, because people are gonna, are gonna have questions, and you're gonna, you're gonna be available, it's gonna be cool. The next one is this, the belief in human deity. All is one and all is God, all right? And then following their beliefs, their conclusion is that humans are divine. It's just consistent. As you look at the first couple beliefs, you kind of just have to assume that I must be God if God is all things. All right? So they're being consistent. That brings us to the next one, which is we need a change of consciousness. Now, this is where it gets really dirty. All right? Because sometimes people will not tell you, I believe I am divine. I believe I am God. There's a lot of people practicing the things that I'm going to get into right now that wouldn't agree with the first three steps. 
But all of these things are consistent with what they teach. So spot the lie, put up your truth radar, and, and be okay with hearing things that you disagree with. God will change your heart, okay? Because we are divine, there are a lot of us that don't know it, and we just need to be awakened. We need to get knowledge. We need to wake ourselves up. It's also known as spiritual amnesia, all right? We need to achieve a true human potential. So that brings us along with the main practices that are super popularized, especially in the Western culture. That brings us to meditation. All right? The Bible talks a lot about meditation, but they completely distort the view. It goes to transcendental meditation or mindfulness meditation, which I like to call mind emptiness. Because they're essentially teaching to empty your mind. You don't become full. You don't fill your mind with anything. You completely empty it. And when you get in that state of conscience, you become enlightened. All right? Your mind is not full. Then that takes us to yoga. This is the one that kind of triggers the nerves. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. But there is an awesome resource. I had the blessed time. The amazing treasure to be able to interview Ray Youngin, an amazing man. He went, sorry, he went to be with the Lord. And I was thinking about it this morning. I was just, it was humbling me because I was like, man, usually I teach on the Bible, evangelistic tools and stuff. But Ray Youngin was an amazing man. He knew so much about this stuff and he was so gentle about it. The guy was seven feet tall and he was, a, he was a gentle giant, just so soft. And he would share, he would share with such grace. And I was like, this is my first like real apologetic teaching. And I was like, man, God, why did you take him home? He could be doing these things. Like it was just a cool moment. So please go listen to him. I have a video where I interviewed him on yoga. He does, he, he talks about awesome, amazing, cool uh, things and, and really ties in with the scriptures. But yoga means union, okay? You're, you're integrating yourself with another spiritual being or becoming unionized, bringing together unity with something else. And so there's all these different beliefs that are tied with it. But the poses, the breathing, they're all said to aid in meditation and increase a person's awareness of their divinity. It's the root of yoga. It's not just a stretch. If you want to stretch, go stretch. I was a wrestler most of my life. I stretch. There's nothing unbiblical about stretching. The moment you do yoga, you're practicing a religious system. Using crystals, channeling spirit guides, hypnosis, these are all things that come from this belief system. And then the last one is Astral projection, which unfortunately is an increasing um, thing coming today. I, I, I think it's crazy, but it's essentially training your soul to have out-of-body experiences. Which, uh, it just, it's, it's very integrated into our culture today. So all of these things remind ourselves that we are God, and you need to awaken yourself to an inner consciousness, all right? This, of course, is a fallible conclusion, but consistent with their first few beliefs because it follows along with they do believe that they are God and God is all things. But folks, I got a, a basic question for you, okay? At the end of the day, if you're thinking about this and you're following this logic and you believe the first three systems, and so now you believe that you are divine, how, be honest with me, how much do you want to follow a God who forgot he was God? I mean, you're thinking right now, i got to awaken my inner self, and I've got to achieve this power. Do you really want to follow that God that doesn't know that it's God? Do you really want to follow that system? Because my God, my God knows he's God. Because he's outside of time and space. And he created all things. Amen? Not to mention right here in Isaiah 43.10, it says, You are my witnesses. I declare this today, and you will declare it as well for me. The Lord declares, My servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. 
Before me there was no God formed, and nor shall there be any after me. Amen? It's simplistic, folks. It's very simplistic. The fifth belief is the oneness of religions. This is where everything starts to tie together and why the ecumenical church and the emergent church fall right in line with this. All right? All are correct. All put us in contact with the ultimate reality, and they are just many paths leading to the same place. This is called religious syncretism. All things are okay. We all synchronize together and we're all climbing this mountain and we'll all get there. We'll all get to the top of that peak. But you go ahead and find your path. I'm going to find my path and we'll meet up top, all right? Everything's acceptable. This is where the ecumenical church comes in because it starts to accept everything. Tolerance. Coexistence. Everything's acceptable, right? Because you don't want to seem unloving. You don't want to seem hateful. So let's just go ahead and say, hey, they're, they're trying. They're doing, God, God's going to appreciate that, that they're trying, right? They're doing things. But then when you have to deal with the very core and foundation of the scriptures, they completely deny everything. I mean, that's why the majority of the ecumenical church teach from I don't even like to call it a translation. It's a paraphrase. The message is one of the most popular translations in the ecumenical church. Because it's a paraphrase of Eugene Peterson stating how he felt when he read the scriptures. Not what the scriptures stated. So when he came across very intentionally uh, hard sayings, he avoided them. Because it would... It would uh, not accept all of his friends and how dare his friends be condemned to hell before a righteous judge. Uh, not to mention the Isaiah 43 verse, but the exclusivity of the scriptures are so clear. I had to remove like 15 verses. I just tried to keep it down to a few. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father Except through me. Acts 4.12 There is salvation in no else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men. By which we must be saved. Romans 3.22 The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there are no distinction. There's no distinction. Go home and chew on that one for a little bit. That one, that one I, I smiled when I read it. Lastly, the, the real Lord's Prayer, John 17, starting in verse 3, it says, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The only one true God. I've heard it a thousand times from the pulpit, and I'm going to keep sharing it. I don't remember where I heard it the first time. But either Jesus was a madman, claiming exclusivity, and he couldn't back it up, so we might as well label him what he is, a heretic, and put him on the cross and nail him and put him in the tomb and state exactly what he is. Or we can see what Jesus did, how he fulfilled all of the promises and prophecies given from old, pointing to him, hundreds of prophecies pointing to him, and he fulfills, and then performs all of the miracles on the earth. I mean, all it would have taken one for me, but tons of miracles. And then finishes it by taking on the punishment of my sin and defeating death and declaring it dead, no longer a sting to us. Folks, he is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And it's exclusive and it's not hateful to say that. It's just the truth. When you get on an airplane and you say, hey, pilot, get me to point B safely, you're trusting that way. Because he learned how to fly the instrument panels that are required. And you don't get to go in there and tell him how to fly. Because guess what? You don't know the way. Jesus is the only way. We live in a social system every day that is exclusive. This is a bad example because there's a couple doors. But if you only had one door in here and I said, hey, everyone go in there, would you be offended if I said you can only go through that door? 
Would you try and like break down the roof and say, how dare you tell me there's only one way? No. No, we live in a world where it's okay to be exclusive. It's not hateful. All right, let me keep flying. Sorry, I know I'm taking a while. He is the only way. The last three, the belief in reincarnation. This has to follow their ideology because if you are a god, right, and you're just learning along the way, you're collecting consciousness, then you just need thousands and thousands of years for repetition to figure it out. You just, you got to keep trying because you have, if you don't think you're God, you just got to keep trying until you figure it out, right? So just keep it, right? But they're avoiding judgment. This is ultimately them trying to avoid judgment, responsibility. In Hebrews 9.27, it's clear and it is appointed for men to die once and after this, the judgment. We all, one out of one men die. Another hateful statement of its time. We will all be given an account for our words and actions, and this is why it's so important to know who the Creator is. Because on that day of my judgment, my Savior will stand in front of me. So I am not avoiding judgment for the sake of ex like getting out of it, slipping by, like the thief trying to get over the fence. No, Jesus stands before me and He says, He is mine, and I took on that judgment for Him. I declare him mine and he is safe. The seventh one is moral relativism, which what's true for you is true for you, but what's true for me could be true for me, and don't you dare tell me mine's wrong because mine could be wrong. I mean, mine could be right and yours is always right. and mine, It's just completely subjective. When you get into a conversation with that, with a person that believes that, it, it, it almost is agitating because they will not be honest. There's no authority. There's no ultimate reason. That's what we're talking about here. Then, moving forward, there's this uh, religious system with the, with the um, uh, moral relativism, relativism where it's avoiding judgment. All right? And it's no different than my five-year-old. She's going to, I don't know if she's paying attention here. She's smiling now. Five years old, when she gets in trouble, she's coming up with lies. She's coming up with a story. She's pointing the finger at someone else. She's doing everything necessary to avoid that judgment, right? That's no different than what these people are doing, except they're calling it religion. By stating that you can be reincarnated and that all things are acceptable and moral relativism, it's just avoiding responsibility. And what do you see today? 40-year-old, 30-year-old people not accepting responsibility. We live in such this woke culture that has this tendency to say, how dare you tell me something is wrong? Right? It's avoiding responsibility. And the religious system is no different. They say, oh, how dare I want to accept a holy God that loves truth and loves righteousness and is holy. It doesn't work for the five-year-old, and I promise... It will not work for God when you stand before Him. He loves you too much to, to act unjustly. God is righteous, and because He's the truth, we must hate lies. So it's not a matter of God just working out to justify sin. No, He became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. Amen? The last one, I'm going to try and fly through, I'm sorry. The last point here is that the coming of the new age, the age of Aquarius, it's headed, it's on our way, right? They believe there is this coming time, also known as the golden age, where it's a time of peace and prosperity. A time of one nation will rule them all. One language, one government, and one religion. This is where I kind of agree in a sense. Not 100%. But does any of that sound familiar to you? Is it starting to spark a little bit if you've read the scriptures before? They believe it to be a progressive evolution. A time where people continue to wake up to their divinity and submit to this one world system where everyone's in agreement. Doesn't that sound nice? Everyone's accepting everyone. But I know it sounds familiar to me when I read the Bible, except it's not a good thing. That's the time where things get terrible. Because people are preaching peace, because people are preaching prosperity and unity and this whole ecumenical movement, tying things together, 
we know that there is a great tribulation leading around that. This tribulation proceeds before it, and the system will be governed by the Antichrist, seeking to bring about the last days. And this is not what our hope comes down to. My hope is not in a place. My hope is not in a better system. My hope is not in this idea of just rest. My hope is in Jesus. Amen. 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 And so we'll end with this. In Romans 5, 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Folks, we are ungodly. And at the end of the day, when you're sharing this information with people, your goal is to not make them just feel like garbage. But it's okay to be honest and tell them, hey, I'm ungodly. And Jesus is who makes me right with him. We are the ungodly. We are not only, we are not gods, but we act completely the opposite of God. That's what the scriptures say. So putting hope in a future system, assuming we'll get it right someday, is hopeless. Because we're never going to get it right. People have been trying for generation after generation. You'd think if evolution were true, we'd be right. We'd be in the golden age. It comes down to our hope being in the only one that sits high above us all and came off his throne to die. Amen? Amen. All right, James. I went a little over this floor. Step down here so I get a little bit of height. 